When injury takes you out of the game, it's time for your team to step up. At Alina Health Orthopaedics, you'll get expert care backed by a whole health system of providers. With convenient locations, virtual options and an app that gives you 24-7 access to your records, test results and care team, you're always close to the care that you need. Schedule now at alinahealth.org slash ortho. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when this finds you. Welcome to the Sound of the Loons podcast. I'm Steve McPherson, and I have some bad slash good news. It's the last day of August. Take that however you want. It's one of those moments where I'm like, I look at my watch to... So when I... <clears throat> this is more information than anybody wants. Sorry, guys. Um, when I name files, like when I save files, I always start with a date, like I write 083121, and then, you know, whatever the whatever the name of the file is going to be. And uh, 31 is always one of those days that I'm like, it feels fake. Like every time there's a, a month that has 31 days in it, it just feels like in too many days. Uh, maybe except Halloween, which I like. But um, I'm kind of happy to see August go personally. It's been hot this summer and uh, fall is my favorite season. Uh, and Callum Williams, who's joining me once again, which is fantastic. Um, what's your feeling on August? You're a pasty Brit. You probably don't like hot weather. Hate it. Hate weather. <laughs> Hate the sun, be away with it. It's awful. I'm not built for the sun and the summer at all. Um, so I, I love the, I love the fall. I love the autumn. It's a great time of year. The only thing is here, though, Steve. During my few years here, my experience is that we only get a, a short little version of it uh, because winter is upon us before we know it. So um, it, it can be a little bit irritating, and it's a shame because. Um, the the fall is uh, is full of lovely colours and it's a perfect temperature. You and I might have said this before on this podcast that um, very much prefer a little bit of a chill in the air, not 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 so much the the winter, but um, that's sort of the weather I grew up with: rainy, crappy, you know, a little bit of chill in the air, and, <laughs> and I'm fine with it. I accept it, and I've grown up with it, so I don't mind it at all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that the um, the if you could find a place so you know if you go to the equator or someplace right you it, it's summer basically all the time um that's that's the vibe and and if you go to florida uh even uh, there's the rainy season but it's sort of like 70 it, it, it kind of unpleasant in, in in the deep summer but um and then if you go someplace really far north it's sort of wintry all the time, you know, like obviously there's, you know, and it's getting less wintry all the time uh, near the North Pole and the South Pole, but uh, unfortunately, but uh, if you could bottle fall, if there was some place you could go that was always fall, like that's, that is absolutely where I would pick to live. I like it to be 55 in the morning, maybe get up to 65, uh, you know, hoodie, jeans. Uh, this is this is what I want. I am wearing, uh, we were talking about fashion before we got on here, and I'm wearing my most comfortable t-shirt, which is I bought at a thrift store in Chicago uh, in 2004. <laughs> it's really wow. not my formal wear, so I, hope, I apologize for everybody who's watching me. Uh, hopefully you're <laughs> just listening to me, but uh, it, it was, it, it's a red shirt that says it, it, victory auto records. You can't see it anymore. It says victory auto records. And there's a dinosaur chomping a car and I love dinosaurs. So, uh, and it's a great comfy shirt, but, uh, that's, that's where I'm at. I'm all about comfort. I'm ready for the fall. Um, I'm ready for back to school. Uh, I know it's, it's a fraught topic right now and we're all trying to figure <laughs> out what's going on with this, uh, uh, COVID surge here, but, uh, it is, it is that time of year and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. We're coming down to the, the stretch of, of the season here. We're past the halfway point. Um, we're going to look back at, let's look back at the last couple of games. It's one of those things I went back. So uh, I went over the Houston Dynamo on the road. First win in Houston in MLS. I believe uh, Minnesota won there in the Open Cup, right? But this is the first MLS win in in, in Houston. Um, and, you know, I remember last week we were very bothered by this idea of being up uh, a man for almost 140 minutes and, and not getting anything other than than a draw. But now as we start zooming back, and this is the way it always goes with seasons, I feel like you look at three games, two road games and one home game, Five points. Seems like a, I mean, that's sort of like, that's the one point for road games and the three points for home games. You just got three points at a road game uh, and you got one point in a home game. So I don't know, like what, like what soccer is weird. That was my conclusion is right here in my notes. It says soccer is weird. What, <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I think the thing is, Steve, that the only disappointment is, is, is obviously the, the not getting the victories that you really need to at home. 
Um, because the, the old saying is, as we've said on this podcast several times, you win your home games, draw your away games. And um, Minnesota have done really well over the course of the last few away games. It's now unbeaten in the last four away games. Um, so there is a, a maturity about them now on the road that I, I don't think was there in previous years. Um, I go into away games now feeling much more confident than I used to in, in seasons gone by. Um, but um, th- there's a, a tinge of disappointment because of the, the way that they were able, were able to get the victories um, you know, against the likes of, of LA Galaxy um, and in the past San Jose and, and what have you um, and, and Kansas City um, as well. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that they've they picked up some good points on the road. Um, you, you hope when you don't get the victory that you want at home that it will come back around at some stage. I, I think it, it, it's starting to look as if, as if it will. Um, and I think it certainly we're well past the fact that it has come back. When you look back at the, the start of the season over the um, when, when the season started in 21, um, and then when you, you look at what's, what's happened over the course of, of the last two, three months, um, the season's certainly come back and it's worked out and, and, and it's, 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 it's been really, really good. But um, I think over the course of the, the last month or so, there have been some irritations for sure. Uh, because as, as we've said several times on this podcast, there is an expectation with this team now. Um, you want to beat the likes of Vancouver on the road. Arguably, they, they should have had it not have been for a, a wayward penalty decision. Um, you know, they probably should have beaten San Jose uh, down to 10 men. They probably should have beaten Kansas City, who were down to 10 men. But um, it's a funny old game. Um, soccer is weird, as you say. Um, and sometimes <laughs> it just doesn't work out that way. Um, and it's not like, you know, um, that they haven't been trying. It's not for the one for trying, you know. Um, the amount of efforts that they've put towards goal again. Uh, I didn't see or I don't remember off the top of my head any sort of final stats for the game against Houston, but, but I certainly remember against Kansas City. Again, there was over 20 shots. It's not the first time Minnesota have executed 20 shots and, and more and not come out with uh, with a win. Um, but, look, good result in Houston. Um, it's come at the perfect time given the fact that, that this week is the international break. I think if they wouldn't have won in Houston or, or if they didn't get a positive result in Houston, because it is always diff- difficult to go down there, mm-hmm. and, and given the fact that there were as many as eight first-team players unavailable, um, I think they probably would have taken a point, given circumstances, but um, there would have been a lingering mm-hmm. irritation for sure, uh, given the fact that they, they didn't win the games that they perhaps should have. But look, nevertheless, they, they, they beat Houston, um, who I know is undergoing a torrid run at the moment. I don't think it's... Uh, they haven't got a win in 15 now, I believe. So it, yeah. it's really bad. Obviously, they got rid of the, the GM, Matt Jordan. That was announced yesterday. Um, so that they're a club that, that are in need of some changes for sure. But it's going to Houston, Steve, it's, it, it, as I said earlier on, first of all, it's never easy. But it's not like they've been a team that have been completely battered from a possessional and scoreline point of view. You know, A lot of their losses have been by a singular goal and, and they've been unfortunate, you know. So um, I think going down there is always always difficult and, and to get a win there. Um, I think, again, Steve, it, it does sort of separate Minnesota United as, as the peak of the, the pack that are chasing the top four. Um, that's what I think Minnesota United are situated at the moment. And that's what I think you probably you probably would have said that's where they're probably going to be, either there or just on the cusp of the top four this season. So top four is the aim, no doubt. Um and this this coming stretch is is going to be absolutely pivotal if they are going to get into that top four come season's end. Yeah, that's a that's after the sort of second half of the show. We're going to talk a little bit about that, like what's what's coming up and and what it's going to take to get into that top four. Um, looking at Houston a little bit, that I, I think you know as you're saying that this this thing of losing by a goal or being close or. It feels a little bit like they don't, and I, some of this is they're a rebuilding team. Like, like Tab Ramos came in, and uh, it, it, the team has changed over a lot uh, since that point. Um, they had this identity in 2017-18 of this this three-headed attack that would just run you out of the building, like with Albert Felice and uh, Romel Kyoto and uh, di- you know different sort of uh, forwards in between them. But like th- that 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 approach and then you know the, the, a tremendous home home field advantage uh which they still maintain um to a large extent uh but they don't have that like identity in the same way right now it feels like like as you as, as you watch them play they've got you know fafa pico who's tremendously fast um but as you saw you know like my overall impression of the game was first of all 
when you give up a goal in the first minute, it's just so odd. It's like, this is not how soccer generally works. Um, usually you see two teams sort of feeling each other out. Um, there's a little bit of, of, of sort of pairing and thrusting and kind of figuring out where everybody is. When a goal happens in that first minute, it's like, okay, let's just sort of reset the game state. And that's kind of how it went. You saw Houston. Um, it, it was interesting. I may be jumping to some conclusions here. I'm not an expert soccer analyst, despite what uh, it might come off, <laughs> come off as. I talk a lot about soccer. To my, I have my experience is mostly watching Minnesota United. Early on, the loons seem to really not know exactly what to do without Reynoso on the field. You know, he's come to be the the sort of the bellwether of how the the play is going to evolve. He where he moves, uh, the ball will go to him. He will switch fields, or he'll he'll take it that way. He can make guys miss. There's just so much that he does with the ball. Um, on the edge of that final third, essentially, that determines how the play goes. And I felt like early on you could see Minnesota sort of not sure exactly what to do without that sort of linchpin out there. Houston did not take advantage of that. It, Houston sat back. Like, it seemed like they they were very content to sort of – they were up a goal. Maybe that gave them a, a, a little bit of a sense of security. But it felt like their, their defense was really in a low block, and it let that midfield for Minnesota United cycle the ball around and sort of find those – those seams. I mean, it's sort of, in some ways it was an ideal situation for Minnesota without Reynoso that like Houston gave them the opportunity to grow into the game. And I think that was maybe Houston's biggest mistake. I think um, you, you're right in, in the sense that obviously Minnesota um, had to figure out what to do with Reynoso. So it was obvious there was limitations for sure. And, and not only Reynoso as well, you know, they've obviously, they, they were without Robin Lerd and Franco Fragapane yeah. and, and an abundance of other players. Uh, but the, the, the main one missing was Reynoso. They, they've had time to adapt without Lord and, and Fragapane and, and a couple of other characters. But um, Reynoso has been the, the main source of creativity. Um, at times, I think, again, I've said on this podcast, at times he's dropped a little too deep for my liking, which I think has, has caused problems for Unu um, and, and a lot of other players that have played at centre forward this season. Um, but he always wants the ball, and that's, that's the problem, is that he always wants to be on the ball, and, and, he, and he can pick out some passes as well from, from deeper positions. We saw there was a goal that Robin Lord scored yeah. earlier this season. I can't remember who it was against, but that was a lovely pinged pass forward from Reno. So, um, so the question is, how do you play without somebody like that? You know, And uh, Hassani Dotson, again, was forced to play in an, an unnatural position, um, and you could tell um, he was tucking in a lot. Um, because he, he's just not a wide player, and that's no fault of his own. He was doing everything he could on that left-hand side, but but he, his natural instinct is to cut in. Um, so the full-backs of the Dynamo and the wide players, the wide attacking players, had a lot more of the ball than um, than I think um, than, than I think they were they've been used to. Um, Fafa Pico had a lot of the ball, um, and a, a lot of that was because of, of Metenier pressing forward as he as he does. Usually as well, um, Adrian Heath, I, I would have, uh, I would assume, would have said if they are going to attack from a wide area, concentrate it down that right-hand side because you do have two natural players on that side. Whereas it's a bit difficult for for Minnesota to come down the left and just rely on Chase Gasper's crossing abilities, you know. So um, there's, there needs to be a lot more. So um, it all it all really changed when Fernando Adi came on, really. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, which I'm sure we'll get to in a bit, but um, no doubt there were limitations for Minnesota. They were forced to play through the centre of midfield um, and, and find uh, Will Trapp, who would dictate uh, and, and play a pass when he could. Uh, Ozzy Alonso uh, held the fort down superbly as well, but they were forced into into going out wide from time to time as well, but, but because of the absence of Reynoso, again, it... it it caused a few issues for sure, but um, it, it, it did just feel quite limited. There was there was one attack, I think it was maybe midway through um, the first half, and a couple of bodies pressed forward, and you could tell they had to go back and recycle because players weren't available that usually would be there. They weren't in the positions that they usually are, and you know. But um, I, I thought it was good, Steve. I thought it was fine. Again, I think we've got to give a lot of credit to those players that that played in that Houston Dynamo game because. Um, you know, there's a lot of those players from an attacking point of view that, that aren't usually asked to, to play in the roles that they that they did. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just very limited compared to 
to what Minnesota usually have, uh, as we've said with some of the names that they, they didn't have available to them. So all credit has to go to that group that, that won. Um, Adrian, made a, Adrian Heath made a, a great point on Friday that these are MLS players and we should expect them to perform regardless of ability. Um, they are MLS players and, and they, they are with this football club for a reason. But uh, it did feel awfully, awfully limited to me. Um, and as I said, you know, I, I think um, Sonny Dalton, it was clear that, that he just wanted to tuck inside and play his natural game. And, um, you know, that, that gave the Dynamo the, the ball in the wide areas a little more than I think they're used to. Yeah, I hope it's, um, I think sometimes this kind of thing can be overstated, but I think that there's there's something to be said about a team getting a win in a tough spot without sort of their, their star player. Um, and the extent to which, you learn to do some other things to use some other muscles as a team, essentially to accomplish something than just go through Reynoso. Um, and I think every team goes through, I mean, I think this team is better than, uh, you know, the, the Minnesota, I mean, obviously it's better than the United, Minnesota United team that had Darwin Quintero as sort of its, its star, but that was a, a symptom that happened with Quintero a lot, which is everybody would just sort of slow down and wait for Darwin to do something. I don't think you've seen that same thing happen with Reynoso, but certainly learning some other ways to go about, you know, having another pitch in your your bag, so to say, like if you're if you're a pitcher, having more than just a fastball and a changeup when you can add a curve and things like that, that that just helps what you can do with the team. If you learn a couple different ways to play, a couple different guys who can help, it opens up the possibility of Reynoso as as sort of a decoy. Uh, there's a lot that can be done with that. So it seems like a overall a positive for them, Cal. Let's talk a little about uh, Adrian Unu, who obviously got off the schneid, I believe is the, the technical term for not scoring in, in nine games, uh, and had uh, a brace uh, in this one. I want to talk a little bit uh, specifically, I mean, we can talk about sort of, you know, just getting the importance of getting that ball to go in the net, which is something that, that Adrian has, has stressed before. Not Adrian, Adrian Unu, but Adrian Heath. Um but talk about him in the, the second striker role, this idea of, especially when Adi came on, uh, him dropping into sort of a hybrid 10 false nine sort of into the slot that Reynoso would sort of normally occupy, but probably a little bit more advanced than that. I felt like you saw a lot of his tool set come out that you haven't gotten to see as much as sort of some longer strikes, you know, on that on the second goal, uh, the throne going to Adi, who was sort of advanced and then Unu come streaking in. You know, if this is what Unu is really built to do, like you think about Robin Lud and him playing sort of on the left last year because or two years ago because he needed to play there because the, the team had a need and he was fine, but not, you know, galvanizing, not sort of what he has become playing on the right and as a, as a, as a forward, as a false nine as well. Um, do you need you need to find some way to to unlock some of Unu's abilities in those realms do you go to a, a two striker, a two forward system? Like, is there, is there, is there something to be done with that? I guess is, is my question. Uh, maybe Unu is just not set up to be that guy who's going to receive the brunt of the center back's attention. You need somebody who's going to be floating in space and finding gaps and, and creating that way. Like what, what, what's been your take on, on Unu in that sort of role? Well, Adrian won't go to a four, four, two. He's never done a four, four, two. Adrian. All right. Well, I'm just deleting the rest two, of three, one. I'm deleting the rest of my notes here because I was going to ask about that. So, all right. I'd, I'd be very surprised, Steve. I'd be really, really surprised. Um, uh, and, and, and a manager has every right to stick with what they're comfortable with, you know. So, I I would be very surprised if he changed things for sure. But, um, you know, I think I might have said it on this podcast, Steve. Um, for a few weeks now, I've sort of wondered um, about Unu in another role and, and particularly in the supporting striker role in uh, somewhat of a, a nine and a half role, if you will. Um, I kept it to myself for a little bit. Uh, I just wanted to assess a bit more. And then there, I think I said it on this podcast about two, three weeks ago that, that I, I wasn't convinced that after an appropriate amount of assessment that Adrian Unu um, was a, a natural centre forward. Um, a lot of his movement inside the box didn't seem natural. Um, there was one particular game uh, away to Vancouver, which we were on site for, and obviously there was no fans because it was in Salt Lake. We could we could hear just about everything that, that Adrian Heath was saying to Unu, and he was saying things like, you know, get in between the centre-backs, get higher up the field. It just didn't seem natural to him. It, it seemed as though he was, he was more comfortable playing much deeper. Um, and when you go back and have a look at a lot of his goals for Rennes, 
um, yeah, there's there's examples of him scoring goals off a set piece, um, much like he, he did, obviously, for the first goal against Houston uh, this past weekend. But a lot of his goals came from, from deeper runs. A lot of his goals came from later runs. Um, so, whilst I understand that there's obviously a need at centre-forward for Minnesota United, I understood why they wanted to try and give it a go. Um, but it just didn't look natural to me. There was, there was one game recently, a home game, where Unu played a good 70, 75 minutes and you know, had a couple of half chances, but, but it, it just didn't look natural. His movement didn't look natural. And then uh, Juan Agudelo came on and Chase Gasper played a ball in from the left-hand side, um, from the right-hand side of the opposing penalty area. And Agudelo got in front of the centre-back and just prodded it wide of the right-hand post. I think, forgive me, I can't remember who the opponent was, but, but I thought to myself, that, that's a centre-forward. Like, Juan Agudelo is naturally a centre-forward, and I know he can play out wide. He does it quite well. He did it well for New England for many years, but, but he is traditionally a centre-forward, and his movement in the box looked like he was a centre-forward. So, um, I, I, I was not surprised at all when Unu scored the second goal that he did. Um, Fernando Adi did a great job with a little back heel into Ethan Finlay, and that secondary run um, came from Unu, um, and, and he was obviously effective and he scored. So, you know, um, like I said, Steve, it's something I've, I've thought of for a while now. It's something I've been saying for a while. Um, and uh, I just wonder now, uh, the, the, the legitimate question is, how do you make this work moving forward? What What is the formation? What what's How do you best suit this to your best players you've got on the pitch? Because if you think about it, when all of the players that have been out for the last couple of weeks are available, uh, Robin Lourdes and Franco Fragapane, Manu Reynoso, three, those three players have to be in the starting 11. <laughs> they have to be in the starting 11. Um, but how do you make it work with Unu? Um, is it a case of we'll see Unu starting up top um, and maybe they ask him to play a little deeper and him and Reynoso start to interchange maybe? I don't know. Um, but if that's going to be the case, then Reynoso has got to remain higher up the field. He can't be dropping back and pinging balls. He has to remain higher up the field. Um, is Unu going to be more comfortable playing in a, a wider area? And I say why because, again, we, we, we've we seen the way that Adrian Heath likes when he's got the right personnel. We've seen the way he likes to play this 4-2-3-1, and it is with inverted wingers. Fragapane and, and Robin Lourdes have, have both thrived in this system, I think, uh, given the, the time that they've had in it. Uh, so I wonder, do we see Unu cutting in from the left-hand side? Um, but then what do you do with Fragapane? <laughs> so I, I don't know, Steve. Um, maybe it is a case where a 4-4-2 slash 4-2-3-1-ish um, is, um, is more appropriate. They, they, they've flirted with a 4-4-2 in the past, for sure, in transition. It's never been the starting formation, but they have, mm-hmm. they have flirted with it, for sure. Um, so I don't, I don't expect a lot to change, really. But um, my, my only thing would be, you know, there's got to be a real shift at some stage if they do operate in a 4-4-2-ish. <laughs> um, does it mean that, that Robin Lourdes perhaps plays alongside Unu um, and Unu drops a little bit deeper when they're out of possession and Reynoso goes a little bit wider on the right-hand side, Fragapane stays where he is, you know, is that something we, we see possibly? With, with Dotson and Trap, those would be, would be my two central midfielders. Um, remaining a little deeper, maybe Dotson provides some support in the eight role for sure. But um, I don't know, Steve. The, the good thing is, is that this is a good problem to have for sure. Um, but it's something that I think over the next sort of 10 days, um, Adrian Heath has got to make a really big decision with it. Because going away to Seattle Sounders is, is a huge game, arguably the biggest game of the season so far. Um, but but also as well, Steve. You know, I mean, I'd be surprised if if the the players that we've just spoken about aren't all playing and available. But also, is it a situation where maybe we see Fernando Adi start in Seattle and they go a little bit more direct as well, simply because it's away at the Sounders. You know, with all due respect, you, you don't do something like that. You know, away to uh, Austin FC, for example. You know, and I say that with all due respect, but that's a game you should be winning. Mm-hmm. But away to the Sounders, given the situation they're in, does he does Adrian he go a little more direct, and does he start Fernando Adi, who you would assume would be much sharper and much more fitter 
at that stage. So I don't know, Steve, but the good thing is, is that there's an abundance of options for Minnesota United. Um, but I, I, more so than ever, heading into this stretch and this spell, I am beyond intrigued to see what Adrian Heath views as his starting 11 and his strongest 11, um, because he's got to get it right moving forward. And, and, and he has got it right in the past uh, when everybody's fit and available. Uh, but now he's got a, a, a real positive conundrum to figure out for his team. Yeah, Cal, it's it's a real it's a real head scratcher. When you proposed Lud and uh, Unu sort of uh, up top in in a two forward formation, I was immediately intrigued with the idea of that. I think that you know I could see something. You know, maybe you don't even have to change the formation uh, so much as just change the approach for how you deal with. With, you, with utilizing Uno, and maybe some of this is something that has even been percolating, but you haven't had Robin Lud for a while because you saw last season down the stretch when you had that sort of four-headed monster of Lud playing the false nine and Kevin Molino and Ethan Finlay and Emmanuel Reynoso out there. All of those guys, to some extent, maybe Finlay a little bit less. He's more of a, a direct, you know, sort of speed effort player, not a playmaker. But certainly Molino, Reynoso, and Lud – can all uh, make plays and they can all score goals. Um, and so there's something of a, of a, of a conundrum for, for the, the defense because they can't, it's not clear who's going to take what role at what time. Um, you know, Kevin Molino had for a long time been sort of the string puller for Minnesota United with Reynoso out there. It freed up Molino to be much more of a, a threat on goal. Um, but he could also still send in great passes. So, there's something to the idea of maybe you, if everybody's healthy and you have Lud and Reynoso and Fragapane and then Unu up top, Unu can still play a little more like a false nine. Like he can play a little bit, a little bit deeper. You can interchange. You could send maybe Lud up there. You could send maybe Reynoso a little up there. That can make a lot of problems for defenses who, if you're if you're man marking, if suddenly guys are not where they're you're used to them being, and there's a little more of a attack by committee up there, um, it can be really it can be really interesting. Um, yeah, I, the, the the idea of Fernando Adi is going to be interesting. Let's touch on Fernando Adi um, because, again, a, a player who obviously is tremendous for the Portland Timbers, just a, a legend uh, in terms of, of, of being a, a gold machine there. And then a real disappointment, uh, you know, for Cincinnati and, and Columbus crew. Um, mm. What do you see? You know, obviously it's been one game, right? We don't we haven't seen that much of, of Adi yet. Um, just how do you assess his prospects for being somebody who you can start out there up top um, for Minnesota United down the rest of the season? I think it fits a need, Steve, for several reasons. As I said, it gives Adrian Unu or Emmanuel Reynoso somebody to play off when they need to. It gives Minnesota United the chance to go more direct when they need to. It gives them a different outlet. It gives the overlapping uh, fullbacks and the wide players something to aim for inside the penalty area. So, um, I thought it was a really smart signing. I didn't understand the criticism for it because he's he's on a, a league minimum deal. I don't know what the league minimum is anymore, Steve. I think it's something like 80 grand a year or something like that. He's on a league minimum deal mm-hmm. for the rest of the season with an option for next year if it works. So it's it's very low risk and potentially right. quite high reward. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't yeah. understand the criticism of it, really. Um, you know, Minnesota aren't going to go and sign Lionel Messi with all due respect. You know, it's... I, I just didn't understand. The you, heard it, you heard it here first, folks. Messi to Minnesota United. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the move. Um, I, I do know for a fact it's not the first time Minnesota have tried to sign Fernando Adi. Um, they tried, I think it was in 2019, uh, when it was it was clear he was he was available. Um, and uh, obviously they didn't sign him. He went elsewhere. I think that might have been when he went to Cincinnati. Actually, yeah. I can't remember. Or, or maybe it was just after or something. I, I can't remember. It's been a while ago now. But I, I do know there was serious interest at some stage. Um, uh, but now he's, he's come in. He's 30 years of age. Um, you know, I, I certainly thought he was a lot older than that when uh, when they signed him. He seems to have been around for an eternity. So yeah, he's at a good age as well. His experience, you know, his, his goal scoring record speaks for itself. I know it didn't work out in in Cincinnati, it certainly didn't in Columbus either. Um, but I, I think, you know, when you bring in somebody like this on a short-term deal, uh, if they can simply contribute, then it has to be considered a success, in my opinion. I'm not expecting Fernando Adi to go and score, you know, what we've got, what have we got, 15 games left? I'm Thir- not expecting 13 games him, left, yeah. 13 games. I'm not expecting him to go and score 10, 12 goals. You know, it's just not going to happen. Um, but if he can contribute with a handful of goals and a handful of assists, 
Um, but more so if he can contribute in the build-up and offering Minnesota United different ways to play and offering them different outlets, um, then I think it can be considered a success, you know, especially with the, the, the wage package that he's on as well, Steve. So, um, as I said, for me, it is extremely low risk. So, it wouldn't surprise me if we see him play more on the road um, and, and we see him uh, come on, you know, last 20, 30 minutes or so, and maybe even start one or two road games. Um, like I said, if, if Minnesota and Adrian Heath feel the need to be a little more direct against certain opponents, maybe they can't play through the midfield like they, they want to against certain opponents. I, I don't know. Um, that wouldn't surprise me. But um, he, he has been brought in to be somebody who, who can come on in the last 20 minutes or so and really offer something different. Uh, but I could also see him starting a handful of games as well. And um, especially now with, with the evidence that um, Unu plays off of a target man. Um, I know we've only seen, what, 20 minutes of it or whatever it was, but it, it, it clearly looked a lot better. So, um, we'll wait and see, Steve. But, but I expect him to, to mainly be coming off the bench uh, and giving Minnesota United a different outlet in the, next, in the last sort of 15, 20 minutes or so of games. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that uh, I think you're right, Cal, to think about it as, you know, it, not every signing that a team makes has to be like the one that makes them a contender or the one that is like this. This makes sense. You need you need bodies. Um, you, there's there's injuries to deal with. Like you said, if it's a league minimum, you know, there's there's low risk. There's upside in that you could retain him if it, if it does work out. If all it does essentially like you're saying, if, if he's being brought on the last you know, 20, 30 minutes of a game, um, if it just helps the Adrian Unu become more of the player he can be, that alone is probably worth it. You know, you've the, it's 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 sort of um, proof of of concept. Then, uh, if you can see Unu really be, you know, a goal scorer down that down the stretch with a target forward to play off of, I think that's I think that's about as much as you could expect. So we should just keep in mind that we're signing has to be like. This is the player who's going to answer all the problems. That's not what Adi is signed to be. He's he's there uh, for a very minimal risk to provide some some benefit. So that's it. When injury yeah. takes you out of the game, it's time for your team to step up. At Align Health Orthopedics, you'll get expert care backed by a whole health system of providers, with convenient locations, virtual options, and an app that gives you twenty four seven access to your records, test results, and care team. You're always close to the care you need. Schedule now at alignahealth.org/ortho. All right, Cal. Let's talk about those thirteen games that are left. It's is it is it time to start thinking about what has to happen over these games for Minnesota's playoff picture? What is it going to take to get into the top four? Uh, there are seven games left against teams with more points than Minnesota United right now. Six games left against teams with fewer points than Minnesota United, which includes a game against DC United, uh, who are who are. Her, their point total is below Minnesota's, but it's not quite comparable because it's the Eastern Conference. So, you know, it's like it's not exact. Mm -hmm. They're not in the same race. And then Philadelphia Union, who are ahead of Minnesota on points right now. So it's, you know, it's fairly even. Like in terms of that strength of schedule, obviously you're playing SKC twice, I believe, Seattle. Yep. There's some there's some tough opponents out there. Um, but, you know, there's also some teams who are below Minnesota United who you would expect them to to sort of feast on. What? What is going to have to happen for Minnesota United to get into the top four? Is it only on them, or do they need somebody else? Do they need something to go, to go wrong for another team? Yeah, you, you would say, Steve, that you, you would assume now that the Sounders and Kansas City may just be a little bit out of reach. But the teams in third and fourth, LA Galaxy and Colorado, you, you would say that if things go Minnesota's way and they find some good wins and uh, the Galaxy and the Rapids drop a couple of points here and there, um, then there's every reason to think that, that they can get into the top four. Steve, uh, by no means have I dismissed the top four finish yet. I think it's still absolutely mm -hmm. there for the taking. Um, but what's going to happen is that they're going to have to win some really, really big games. I think they're going to have to win. Um, they're going to have to win another road game or two for sure. Um, mm -hmm. the, yep. next, the next three games, Steve, are massive. When you think of Sounders away, Kansas City away and home to LA Galaxy. That that is that's potentially season defining. That is those next three mm -hmm. games. Um, you know, you, you host Houston. You know, you'd expect to beat them at Allianz Field. Uh, the game against DC uh, and the the game against Philadelphia as well is an interesting one because whilst you don't want to lose points, there is a little element of 
th- th- there's a lot less risk with those games because you're not playing a conference opponent for sure. But um, mm-hmm. because those games are so late, particularly the Philly game, I, I don't know if we can take that into consideration this time because you just need to get as many points as you can. Um, hosting LAFC is is always going to be a big one. You, you need to win. You need to win games away at, at NFC, in my opinion. Um, you need to win away to Vancouver Whitecaps. Um, and there's some other games as well. Like the, the, the last game of the season, Steve, away at LA Galaxy. I mean, that's massive, that is. That could yeah. really be for a place in the top four, that could, you know. So, um, I, I think Minnesota could, could do with two away victories. Um and as long as they, they don't drop any points at home as well, you know, I think it'll be fine because um, they, they've got to keep up with the pace setters, you know, they really do. Um, I, I can see the Galaxy with, with their fixture list, that there's a couple of potential banana skins there. Um, the Rapids have been, uh, for me, probably the surprise package of the season. Um, I think it's fair to identify them as that this year. Uh, I certainly didn't have them. I had them just maybe just squeaking into the playoffs. I didn't have them anywhere near the top four. Um, so it's a, a massive credit to Robin Frazier in the way that, that he's got mm-hmm. that group playing. Um, you know, Minnesota play at home to Colorado as well in the, the last stretch of the, of the game. So um, I think it's, what do you say, 13 games left? Yep. I, think it's, uh, I think it's essentially 13 cup finals for Minnesota United. And you, you've <laughs> got to win. You've got to win as many as you can. Um, yeah. But there, there will be expectation to, to beat those teams that aren't in and around them. Uh, I think that's fair. You go to Vancouver, uh, you go to Austin, uh, and I think those uh, those uh, are games that you would expect Minnesota United to win. Um, but try and give themselves as much breathing space as possible. Win the games you're supposed to. Um, and if there's any slip-ups in their home defeats and what have you, um, then I think the, the hill that is already... Um, I'm not going to say steep, but a decent climb. <laughs> I think yeah. it becomes. Uh, I think it becomes uh, quite steep and substantially steep at some stage. You know, you can't. You can't afford any more home slip-ups. Um, like I said, I, I know. I know. There's still a lot of football to be played, even 13 games. Um, and I'm not suggesting that one home loss is completely cataclysmic. I'm not. I'm not su- suggesting that because um, I do think. I do think the other teams are going to slip up here and there as well. Uh, but I do mm-hmm. think it's important to, to get as many points as you can at home uh, and, and try and get a couple of away victories. And I think Minnesota will be OK. Yeah, I think that looking at it from uh, looking at, into some of the, the sort of underlying numbers, Cal, the, and this sort of depends on how you know, I'm going to talk about the numbers are and then we're going to talk a little bit about you can decide what you think it means. Um, expected points is is, is a, a stat that that's based on expected goals. Essentially, if you look at teams, we've talked about expected goals before saying how, you know, what are the quality of those chances? Expected points are if you basically run those chances back like a thousand times and you see that they would have scored more often than not in this situation, if, even if they didn't, how often would you expect them to win and take points? Um Colorado and the Galaxy are both outperforming their expected points by about 10. So they're each expected to have based on, you know, trying those running those games again, uh, 10 fewer points than they have right now. Um, so they're they're outperforming sort of that metric. Uh, Minnesota United are underperforming by about five, as we've seen. They've had trouble finishing despite having f- fairly decent chances. So they're underperforming that. The only team that's underperforming worse, I believe, expected goals. But um LAFC are underperforming their expected points by about 15. So LAFC should, is really not living up to um, the chances that they're creating. Then behind Minnesota United, Portland are overperforming by about 4.5. San Jose are overperforming by about 3.5. Now, none of that is to say like this is the this is the formula that tells you who's going to win or not. I should point out, this is one thing I discovered in looking at this. In 2019, uh, there were 13 teams ahead of Toronto in expected points and 15 ahead of Seattle, and those were the two teams in the MLS Cup final. So, this is not like this, this is not the, this is not the secret to how to figure this stuff out. But it just sort of depends on how you think about it. Like our teams that are outperforming their expected goals, expected points. Uh, are they better than those metrics? Is this just a quality that a team will have to develop in order to become like a real championship contender is to do is to finish some of those chances that they shouldn't really be finishing? Uh, or does it just mean that they're getting lucky at a particular time and they're eventually going to regress, uh, you know, to the mean over the course of a whole season? I don't know. I'm not sure what the answer is for that. But I think that what it, it points to is essentially what you're saying, which is that I think that Seattle and SKC at this point, it feels like you can pretty much pencil them in for one and two in some in some order out there out west. 
Colorado and the Galaxy, I'm less confident in. Um, I think, like you said, there's some banana peels out there. That's a great way to put it for, uh, for, for the Galaxy. Again, I think when teams really outperform sort of expected metrics, uh, it could mean that they just have something. This is their this is their year to do that. Um, but it could also mean that they're going to stumble and that some of those things are not going to come through. Um, we've seen like NYCFC, for example, is one of the, the best teams by those underlying numbers. And you can see it. Tade Castellanos is a great player, but has not finished every chance he should have finished. So that's sort of where you see those things come out. So I think ultimately that the opportunity is there for Minnesota United to, as you say, um, take care of their home games. You could lose a home game maybe uh, if you take some of those games on the road that you're not expected to win. Certainly a top four finish is not out of the question. I thought the the final note on this that I thought was pretty interesting is that um, since those first four losses, uh, Minnesota United have played at a 1.82 points per game pace, which is Sporting Kansas City's exact pace for the whole season. So you're talking about putting aside those first four losses, which of course have hurt Minnesota United and made it a much harder climb for them. They've been playing at a pace that would put them number one, number two in the West right now since that point. And I think that's a pretty fair assessment of how well Minnesota United have done so far. Yeah, absolutely. The one thing I will say, Steve, is I I think whoever came up with the expected wins suggestion in Major League Soccer is a very, very brave person because this is a league that is built on parity. (laughs) <laughs> and you just never know. You just True. never know. I mean, that now it's a little more, when you start to identify teams at about this stage, you know, past the halfway point, you know, and you can start to see what kind of a season maybe people are having. There does become expectations, right? You should beat this team. Maybe you should beat this team. But overall, Steve, I've never seen a league like Major League Soccer where anybody on their day can beat anybody. So I, the expected goals, the expected wins rather in, uh, in this league, I think is awfully brave. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, obviously it's not, it's not everything. You look at a team like LAFC in 2019 who are tremendously dominant through the regular season and then, you know, still didn't end up going to the final, the New England revolution or really running away with the Eastern conference. That's by no means a guarantee that of success in the playoffs. It's kind of one of the fun things though, about this league is you have, you know, the regular season and the supporter shield. And then you have the playoffs, uh, which is a much more familiar format for, for people who follow most American sports. And again, in the playoffs, especially now with, with only a game without, without, without the two leg format, anything can happen. Who knows? Like crazy, crazy stuff happens. It's MLS. That's what, that's what we're here for. right, Cal? That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying, mate. It's MLS and, and it's just the most unpredictable league in the world. I've had so many, so many of my friends back home, um, ask for suggested tips and bets and stuff. And I said, well, well first of all, I can't tell you, but um, I, I would say uh, don't waste your money because <laughs> you just never know. You just never know in yeah. this league. It's just, it, it's crazy. So, um, but this is why we love it, Steve. We love the raw nature of Major League Soccer. And um, the good thing is, I think that's translating across the country and across the world now. It's just how good the league is becoming. And, and um you know, uh, we we saw on on today on on deadline day um, in across Europe, we we see so many young Americans making moves and stuff. You know, that wasn't the case even when I came back here when I first joined Minnesota, what about nearly five years ago. Um, you wouldn't see the amount of Americans moving around that are now, um, and a lot of that is is because of of the structure of Major League Soccer and and um, the importance of wins in certain games and what have you. You know, so um, it's a good league, Steve. It's 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 it, it, if it's anything, it's really entertaining. <laughs> so um, I'm looking forward to the final 13 games, Steve. I really am. Um, and as I said, for, for Minnesota United, essentially, I think it's 13 cup finals. Yeah. Well, on that uh, cheery note, uh, which should make everybody not too nervous about every game that's coming up. Thanks for joining us for the 156th Sound of the Loons podcast presented by Alina Health Orthopedics. Be sure to leave us a nice review on iTunes or at the very least a five-star rating and follow the team on Twitter at MNUFC. You can follow Cal at CalWilliams.com. You can follow me at Steve Venturis. Apologies, as always, to Richard Wagner. And remember, there's only one person in this whole world like you, and people can like you exactly as you are.